this video takes the place of the class that was held on January the 18th at 7 o'clock in Bioma. That's the Bible Institute of the Macon area. I'm Kevin Lucas, the uh, director of Bioma and the teacher of the class. The class is Cults, World Religions, the Occult, compared with the Word of God. We're beginning this class, and all are welcome. Anyone who wants to attend, it happens on Thursday at 7 o'clock. This is the first lesson, and we will cover the material as we open up our class. Again, this class is replacing the one that was not able to re be recorded because of a technical difficulty. The name of the class is uh, Cults and World Religions and also the Occult. And we are going to be studying each one of these and comparing them with the Word of God. Let me begin by um, giving you some orientation as to some of the resources that are available for the class. Anything that you need for the class, including um, all of our papers and syllabi, are found at Bioma on the website, which is www dot macon victory dot org and go to the resources page and go to bioma notes and you will find all of the uh, information plus much much more on the bioma website and so you're certainly welcome to download they're all in pdf form and all of that is available for you among the things that you'll find there is a paper called The Mystery of the Trinity. One of the things that we'll be dealing with is an area that is oftentimes disputed among the Jehovah's Witnesses and other cultic groups, and that is basically the Trinity of the Lord Jesus Christ um, and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Now, another thing that is always in dispute when it comes to the uh, cults is the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so another paper that you will find there on the uh, Bioma website is also our paper on testimonies to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The explicit and implicit uh, testimonies that Jesus Christ was, in fact, who he said he was and we invite you to download that in a PDF form. Also, you'll find on the website the syllabus for this particular course, which is um, for world religions, cults, and the occult. And it gives our outline and projected um, information for the class. It tells you about the textbook and um, also some contact information for me and other things like that. So you're welcome to all of this. It is all on our website. Again, that is www.makin.org, makinvictory.org. And you're certainly welcome to all of the material and uh, several um, other publications that you'll find there, including several books that I have written to help you with your study of the Word of God. Again, all of this is free. We do take love offerings, um, but there is no charge for this. All right, let's begin our look today at the introduction to cults, the occult, and world religions. This will be the study that we will be engaged upon for the next 18 to 20 weeks. And again, a lot of this will depend on um, whether we are able to accomplish everything that we need to accomplish and also according to the class um, desire, if the class desires to go into something in more depth. Let me begin by sharing with you a uh, memory device that I have found very helpful when it comes to understanding the cults. Um, it spells out cults, C-U-L-T-S, and each one of these things is one of the characteristics that we find true of every cult. First of all, every cult either denies, that is like the Jehovah's Witnesses denying, diminishing or the Roman Catholic Church places Mary at the same level as Christ. And so therefore, 
um, that is a, a diminishing of the deity of Christ or redefining like the Mormon church does in saying that, yes, well, Christ was God, just like you are God. And again, all of those things are contrary to the original teaching of the scripture. Secondly, cults have an ultimate authority in something else than the Bible. Whether we're talking about the uh, science and health and key to the scripture by Mary Baker, Baker, Baker Glover Patterson Eddy, or we're talking about uh, the Book of Mormon or um, the New World Translation, all of these things are contrary to the scripture. All of these uh, organizations were led or founded by some dynamic apostate. Every one of them are totally exclusive. That means that only the people who are in these groups are the ones who are saved. And so uh, you have to be a Mormon or you have to be a Jehovah's Witness or you have to belong to the Worldwide Church of God. We believe that the only people who are really saved are those who have had a born again experience with Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter whether you're a Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Church of God, Holiness or Roman Catholic, have you had a personal relationship with Christ? And finally, all of these groups teach us salvation by works something other than the work of Christ. They all think that they either do something or add something to the salvation that was given by the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's a brief little memory device that will help you understand what a cult is. Now let's talk about why the cults are growing and what is the situation in the current um, state today concerning cults. This is a day of new religious cults and occult groups. Um, there are many strange concepts that are now proliferating, especially among teenagers and young adults. And these are the people that we find are more and more vulnerable to these cults. And there are some very good reasons why. And a lot of it has to do with our educational systems today. And then um, something we need to be aware of is that more than ever, our society has become pluralistic. Christianity is no longer a consensus religion, but rather is simply another option in the whole cafeteria of religious choices. In other words, what I'm saying today is that there are many people who treat religion like going to the SNS cafeteria. They'll pick a little of this and they'll pick a little of that and they'll pick a little of something else and combine it together. And so this is why there is an atmosphere today where cults and the occult with its emphasis on um, trying to um, uh, reach a supernatural state on, by, some, uh, by some esoteric method uh, have become so popular in the time in which we live. Christianity is no longer considered mainstream or even acceptable among a lot of the people. In fact, many people are calling this the post-Christian era. I disagree with that. I, I believe we're in what we would call the return of the pre-Christian era. We're going back to what the paganism and hedonism was at the time of uh, the apostles and prophets and such like that. And this is the time in which God has called us to be witnesses and workers. And so this is some of the reasons why the cults are starting to um, move in and some of the reasons why we ought to study the cults. Let's look a little closer at why there is such a dramatic growth in the non-Christian religions, the cults, and the occult. And I think the first thing that we can clearly say is that um, we're living in a time in which there is a bankruptcy of materialistic values for our society. Everything today is based upon material things and um, even humanism, uh, which focuses on the, the natural and that which is here and now. The fact is, however, we were created with a spiritual component, and that spiritual component desires to have spiritual contact. 
there's a part of us that is not happy unless it has a spiritual um, unless it has a spiritual contact. And so this is one thing that the cults are offering. They're offering a contact with the spiritual part of man. I believe that they're offering the wrong type of contact, but I do believe that they are offering a contact. Secondly, our culture is turned from a factual to an experiential orientation, largely as a result of the educational movement of the West today. People are trying to find meaning through emotional and mystical experiences because they've been taught that there are no absolutes. Hence, they turn from Christianity, which is based and anchored in absolutes and based on the whole idea of there being such thing as um, factual um, statements. And so they move to the more esoteric offerings of the world religions, the cults, and the occult. Something else that has been very helpful in bringing about the conditions for the cults is the fact that in spite of the electronic revolution, which has connected people more than ever before, there is a desperate sense of loneliness that has occurred within um, the world. People are more um, connected by all sorts of devices and gadgets and gizmos, but more isolated and lonely than they ever have been in their life. And one thing the world cults and religions are very good at is providing networking so that uh, people may be able to uh, not feel so lonely and be so isolated. One thing we can learn from the cults is their care for their people. Others in our culture are attracted to charismatic authority figures of the world religions, cults, and occult. Often these figures promise by following them that your circumstances can be changed and that you can rise above your personal circumstance and find a better destiny. Because of the worldliness and perverseness of the human heart, Many are being drawn into the exotic ideas and lifestyles offered by the various world religions and cults. And so we have a deadly mix in our world today. Now we're being told today that there is no such thing as being right or being wrong, but yet we find that the people who say that there is no such thing as right and wrong say that what we teach, that is there is right and wrong, is wrong. How can that be? We should never forget that the mastermind behind each of these cults and world religions and the occult is that one that would seek to blind the minds of those who would believe the gospel of Christ, that is, the devil. Um, there is only one way that man can solve a geometry problem. An algebraic equation or a chemical analysis, or even, for that matter, a spiritual truth. And yet the devil, who has tried to blind our mind, has convinced us in the West that all roads lead to God. Now, if we applied this logic to geometry, to algebra, or chemistry, we would not find the correct answer. In fact, we would end up killing ourselves. We need to understand today that there is like a, ge ge a geometry project, there's only one right answer and there are 359 degrees of being wrong. These occult practices today may come very close to the truth. They may be very far from the truth, but we need to understand today that there is only one truth and that truth is the gospel found in Jesus Christ. Now, if that is true, that there is the gospel found in Christ and it is the answer to our problems, why has the church failed to reach people? Well, let me suggest to you today that a large number of the so-called Christian churches are themselves unable to provide help and solace for those seeking after God since they themselves have lost all of their contact and spiritual power before God. They no longer can help anyone else because they themselves are dead. Many of them cry, Lord, Lord, but they are far from him. 
even among those churches that do possess true spiritual life. There has been a growing tendency to replace the life-giving relationship with Christ with an external religiosity that deadens the church and make it unable to assist those who are truly seeking life from God. There has been a tendency among true Bible-believing churches to view those who ask questions and seek after truth as enemies or rebels, rather than attempting to answer their questions, especially our young people, with honesty and depth. We have often preferred to condemn them or to ignore them. Because we are so shallow in our own faith and understanding, we have begun to seem afraid of those who ask us why we believe what we believe. And then some theologies, particularly the Reformed theology, who view themselves as being the elect of God and are not particularly interested in anybody outside their small circle, have positively repelled genuine seekers after truth. On the other hand, we have been so engaged in pragmatism on one side that the emerging church uh, movement that has come out has told us that there is absolutely no difference between the person who is lost and the church. And we've tried to make everybody feel at home in the church, and in so doing, we have lost our message. The church no longer speaks to this generation because we have tried to identify so much with the generation that we have forgotten that God is holy. And so for these reasons and many others like them, the church has ceased to be the place to which people go for answers. Uh, this is partly our fault and partly the fault of the culture that has told us that there is no such thing as right or wrong. Regardless, we have largely failed in our task to uh, reach the world of, of lost men and women, boys and girls, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. How sad it is that today the churches are folding up and closing just at the time when so many people are looking for real answers. So, as we begin this study, I need to ask the question, what is this study designed to do? Well, it is designed for Bible-believing Christians to fi who find themselves bewildered or uninformed concerning the great spectrum of unbelief or false religion that is true in our world today to combat the failure of our churches to try and answer the questions of so many young people today. The study is designed to take away the fear of witnessing to those of other faiths and to dispel the knowledge um, that some have or the thought that some have that it's futile to witness to others of different faiths or for those who are caught up in cults or the occult. This study is designed to give you new perspectives on the needs of people and what they might be willing to do in their quest to have their questions answered and their basic needs met. This study is important because of the decline of true biblical Christianity of our day and the rise of religions, cults, and the occult. And by the way, you are far more likely to meet somebody who's involved in one of these contrary faith systems, even within your own home, even within your own family, simply because this is what we are facing today. More than ever, we are less homogenized as a people. And that's a good thing. But we should also realize that it gives us a wonderful opportunity to spread the gospel to many people who either have not heard the truth of Christianity or have only heard a caricature of Christianity. So how can we look at um, religious thought in our culture today? There are several ways we could go at it. We could look at it at how they deal with God. There are religions that are polytheistic, that is, they have many gods, and we could uh, include in that the Mormons and the Hindus, um, there are those who are monotheistic. This is like Islam and some parts of Christianity um, that have gone astray. And of course, we too are monotheistic. 
There are many today who have embraced pantheism, that is, that God is everything and everything is God. And then increasingly in our culture today, we're finding those who identify themselves as atheists. We could look at it and how um, we deal with relationship to God. Some people have a personal God. I believe in a personal God, and I have a personal relationship with him. But there are many people today who worship an impersonal God. This is particularly true of many of the Eastern uh, thought meditative religions in which um, their gods really have no contact with them. In fact, they find that um, that's not something they're really looking for. They simply want to um, have an inner understanding of themselves. And then there are many today who say there are no gods. We could look at it based on the source of their religion. There are the biblical faiths that base their faith on the word of God. There are others who base their faith on extra biblical texts. That is the Book of Mormon for the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Doctrines and Covenant, the Pearl of Great Price and other books that they use, or the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses, which is not a translation, but an interpretation. You can look at uh, the writings of uh, the uh, uh, of the Eastern mysticism and, and such like that. All of those things are replacement, and so those would be considered extra biblical. And then there are those that are non-biblical. That means that have an entirely world view that is different from that which the Bible says. We could look at it at their uh, perception of reality. Some people are spiritual. And, and believe everything is actually spiritual and what we see is not real. Or materialists who think that everything is real is material. Or those who are dualists who believe that both spiritual and material is true. You can do it on the basis of experience, like objective and subjective. But how we will examine them, we'll look at real Christianity first, counterfeit Christianity next, mystical religions, moralistic religions, and finally, materialistic religions. Now, um, how will we treat each of these religions? Well, first of all, we'll look at their backgrounds and teachings in an honest and fair way. We'll give an evaluation of each faith system and then compare it with the teachings of the scripture. And then, and most importantly, and I really think that this is key, and I'd like to just spend just a moment talking about this. There is really no reason for us to study all of these unless we have a desire to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The whole purpose of this study is not to make us smarter or to make us more in line with um, understanding what world religions and cults are all about. Our whole goal is to try and reach these people with the gospel of Christ. You say, why do we need to reach them with the gospel of Christ? Well, the Bible teaches us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have all gone out of the way and we have gone astray from God Almighty. And the wages of sin is death. They may deny it. They may not agree with it, may not believe it. But the, that doesn't change the reality. Nonetheless, the soul that sinneth it shall die. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we take the glorious gospel that Jesus paid for our salvation on the cross of Calvary out to a lost and dying world. Now, in order to do that, we need to know what these people believe in order to reach them and to... Uh, overcome the hurdles and obstacles that they would place in the way of our witnessing. And so, once again, just sort of to recap this, we'll look at the backgrounds of all of their teachings. We'll look at the history of them. Um, we'll use the original sources to do that. Then we'll evaluate them and compare them with the scripture. And finally, we'll talk about how we can win these people to the Lord Jesus Christ and how we can share the gospel with them, because it is our responsibility to share the gospel of Christ with everybody we come in contact. And so it is our prayer that this will be a fruitful study. 
Now, the next thing that we want to consider, if we would, please, is the whole idea of uh, the guiding principles for our study. Uh, and there are really basically four of them. We're going to try and keep our analysis very simple. These cults can really get complex. And um, literally, I could spend months talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses. I could spend months talking about the Mormons. I could spend months talking about the Unity School of Christianity. I can talk about Islam or Roman Catholicism or any of the other groups that we're going to be dealing in this study. But the truth of the matter is that um, uh, the, the more in depth we go, the more confusing it gets. So I will take a very simple view. I will give you the basic facts. I will keep our analysis organized for every one of the cults that we will deal with and world religions we will deal with. I'll give you a fact sheet that will help you understand it in a glance so that you can um, be organized to use this in the future because what good is having this information if you cannot put it to use we will keep the analysis brief that means we will not give you all that there is to understand about all of these cults um, but we will be selective in what we give that will be able to help you get a complete picture and be able to completely be able to witness to them uh, when they where, where they need it most, and then we'll try and seek to keep our analysis practical. We'll talk about the practical ramifications of their belief system, because ultimately we want this to be workable and usable for everyone. Now that brings us to the main thing that we want to look at today, and that is simply a passage of scripture from First Peter chapter three and verse fifteen. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh uh, you a reason of the hope which is that is in you with meekness and fear. This is sort of our um, key principle that we're going to be using and coming back to all again and again. This is sort of the foundational verse for apologetics. Now, the word apologetics doesn't mean we're being sorry about something. The word answer there in the scripture is the Greek word apologia or apologia. And it simply means to give a formal answer, for example, in a lawsuit or in a trial. And so... The idea here is that we want to be able to give an answer. And in order to give that answer to uh, the lost people and to our own people so that we can understand what they believe, we need to handle this very carefully. So I'd like to break this verse down into its constituent parts and look at them for just a moment. First of all, let's consider the words, but sanctify the Lord uh, God in your hearts. There are several things that arise when we look at this. First of all, we should come to the place to realize that before we can witness to another person, we must be sure that we have submitted our own life to the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. The Lord must be free to rule in our own heart before we can help others. Our spiritual status must be settled once and for all and should be settled once and for all if we are to give an answer for the hope that lieth in us. But we need to understand that we need to constantly and daily submit ourselves to him so that we can be in the position to help others. Now, the second thing that arises out of this as we sanctify the Lord in our heart is that we should, if we do that, we should expect that God will work through us. Today, we need to make it very clear that our confidence is in God and not ourselves. I cannot change the mind of anyone. That is God's business. But if you pray and if you prepare it will amaze you how many opportunities God will provide you. 
God is in the business of providing opportunities for those who are willing to prepare. Now, this is a spiritual battle, and it is not just a battle of knowledge or clever argumentation. In our church, this year's church-wide theme is putting on the whole armor of God, and it fits very nicely in this thought. In the panoply of God's armor, there are two offensive weapons, the word of God and prayer. In dealing with cultists, the occult, and world religions, both need to be handled with practice, careful practice, and with care. This course will help to prepare you to do so. To be truly effective, we must search out any unloving and disobedient attitudes and confess them to God so that we can be used effectively. Knowledge without love, as we are told in the book of 1 Corinthians, is useless, and obedience without love is without profit. We must develop a spiritual patience if we are to deal with those who are in the grip of false religion. This is not a quick handing out of a tract or God's simple plan of salvation type of encounter. It will require hours many times of discussion and many encounters before the spiritual claims of Christ and the powerful word of God can break through the hardened heart of those who um, need Christ the most. These are false cultists and religionists, but more than that, they are souls for whom Jesus died. And in doing this, we need to be very careful to examine our own motivation. Are we trying to seek these folks out, out of a genuine love and concern for their souls, for a person who is... Uh, entrapped in uh, some kind of false religion and, and belief? Um, or are you simply doing it because you feel guilty um, that somebody needs to do it and you guess that you're the person that has to do it because nobody else will? Unless we come to it with the idea that we are in this to serve the Lord and to try and reach people we are to love Jehovah's Witnesses. We are to love Mormons. We are to love Roman Catholics. We are to love abolitionists. We are to love militant atheists. We are to love those who have placed themselves like the materialist on the path to destruction. We are to love them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is very easy to do the right thing for the wrong reason. And so right now, as we begin our study, we need to make sure that we have no ulterior motive in our heart and or in our soul, that we are doing everything that we are doing because we have a love for the Lord Jesus Christ and a love for the souls of men. Without either one of those two, we are not going to be effective as a witness or as someone who will be able to lead these people to the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is powerful. It can do many things, but it cannot work through a heart that is a dirty and filthy. The Bible makes it clear that if we regard iniquity in our heart, the Lord will not hear us. And so at the outset of our understanding and of our study, let us make sure that our motives are pure and clean and that our hands and hearts are clean as we come before the Lord. And let us come with the thought in mind that we are not trying to win an argument, but win a soul. We are not trying to score a point, but we're trying to save a soul. We are not trying to defeat a system we are trying to rescue the perishing. If we have these things in mind, we will have sanctified the Lord in our heart and made ourselves ready to reach the souls of those who are outside the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, the Bible says that we should be ready always um, to give an answer to those who are outside of the faith. Let's look at that phrase for just a minute. Part of being ready is having a growing knowledge of the Bible. This requires regular Bible reading and study. Now, it's a good thing to read the Bible through once a year, but this is simply not enough. We should always be studying some smaller and more manageable portion of the Word of God. Setting aside um, our daily reading and really digging in deep so that we can understand the Word of God. Now, we need to understand these things because the average cultist is going to come to us and is going to twist the Scripture. It's going to uh, take our terminology and those things that we say and twist them and adapt it to their terminology and make it seem like we're in agreement when we are clearly not in agreement. And we will look at that for some of these cults. My wife for many years worked for in the banking industry. And one of the things that the American Banking Association does is that every year they take certain groups of tellers up to uh, the uh, Treasury Department and they allow them to handle the real money. They uh, look at the real money, they handle the real money over and over again. The reason for this is they want them to be so thoroughly versed in the real money that when counterfeit money comes across their desk, they can be very much aware of it. And so we need to know the word of God. I think the average Christian makes a terrible mistake in thinking that they cannot witness to a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or a Roman Catholic or an atheist evolutionist or even a Satanist. You see, many of them do not know or understand their faith about like many of our Christian brothers and sisters do not know and understand it. And those who do know their faith have been led astray. Uh, by false teachings. We need to learn how to use specific passages of Scripture. We will not have the opportunity to run for reference books or concordances while witnessing to an occultist. Therefore, we must always have a clear biblical knowledge of the Scripture, uh, especially concerning the deity and exclusive claims of Jesus Christ. We should always be ready to share the way of salvation from the Bible and to know how to emphasize the problem of man's sinfulness and the glory of God's loving provision of salvation in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be able to defend the authority of the Bible as the revealed word of God. Um, learning Bible verses concerning the Bible's inspiration, preservation, and authority is the best way to do this. C.H. Spurgeon said that he did not have to defend the Bible. The Bible is like a lion, he said. Set it free, and it will defend itself. Be able to straighten out the misconceptions about the meaning of Christianity. Many have embraced a false teaching of the cult because they've never heard a true presentation of real Christianity. They've only heard the caricatures that have been totally unappealing because of their distorted perception from their perceived teachings on the person and work of Jesus Christ. It is often necessary to explain what Christianity is not before you can tell what it truly is. And it helps to have some understanding of the teaching of that particular religion or cult, especially if you have regular contact with someone who is enmeshed in that cult. While there are good books on cults out there, one of the things that I look forward to every year at the Friends of the Old Library sale is to stock up my shelf with cultic materials, which I can use in the defense of the faith while not enriching the particular cult I'm studying. Some of you know that I actively solicit cultic and false teaching materials which come into your hands to add to my collection. 
Now, I don't use this at, often by for everyone, but for those who are well taught in the scripture, it is very important to go to the original sources and not quote what somebody said about these cults, but actually go to their own material. This can be a real help when you are studying the cults. And we'll be looking at some of the things directly from their own materials. Now, the Bible says not only should we um, have this be ready always, but we should give an answer. What does it mean to give an answer? Well, uh, this word apologeo, it means to not allow ourselves to get sidetracked on minor issues. Always to focus on the fundamental doctrines about Christ and his work of salvation. We need to stress in our answer to them about the uniqueness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need to waste our time on peripheral doctrines, as good as they might be, uh, concerning customs or minor doctrines or even dress styles. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Now, we should never allow occultists to use biblical proof proof texts out of context to support his cultic doctrine. The best way to destroy a cultic person's arguments is to make him look at the passages both in the immediate and broader context surrounding his so-called proof text. The scripture is its own best interpreter, and it is important always to use clear passages to illuminate passages that might appear unclear. It is crucial to distinguish between salvation by grace through faith and salvation by works. Every non-Christian religion, occult and occultic faith, uh, teaches some kind of works for salvation or enlightenment. It may be acts of devotion or denial or even moral behavior, but every single uh, other way that mankind has embraced is based on human merit and human works. And there we have an advantage, for mankind has embraced that which is based on human merit. But the Bible teaches that uh, as Christians, we can be sure about our condition after death, not because we are superior people, but because we have a superior Savior who made a salvation that takes away our sins past, present, and future. Now, let me say this to you today. The truth of God's word must always be primary and any experience we've had secondary in witnessing to a cultist. Experience should always be based on the truth and truth is not determined by one's experience, but by the scriptures. And if you do give a, an occultist or a cultist any books or material to read, make sure you've read them first. Even if a book is telling the truth, it could be written in a harsh or offensive manner and would close the doors of contact between you and the cultists forever. Also, don't substitute any book, no matter how excellent it is, for the Word of God. God has never promised to bless books of any author but he has promised to bless God's word. And this is how we can give an answer to every person for the reason of the hope that lies within us. Now, let's consider this answer. It should be an answer that is clear. It should be an answer that is scriptural. It should be an answer that is based on not one passage but on the multiplicity, uh, the, the sense of the scripture. Yes, I can find one passage or two passages that might seem to teach baptismal regeneration, but when I take the entirety of the scripture, it is very clear that either there has been a misinterpretation or someone has twisted the scripture and taken it out of context. So we need to teach the cultists how to look at the context of Scripture. And in doing so, we will always defeat his 
uh, interpretations because basically they're based on proof text that are wrenched out of their context and allowed to say something that they really don't believe. Our answer must be a solid answer, a substantial answer. And actually, this is what the cultist has been looking for and desires. We need to give them what they want and what they need, which is the truth of the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And our answer always needs to be saturated with the scripture. It never needs to be our opinion. It doesn't matter what we say. What matters is, thus saith the Lord. And it's amazing how over time, if you keep going back to the scripture and quoting the scripture and showing the scripture and its content, it will be amazing how many times you will find the barriers will be broken, the heart will be open, and the person will be ripe to hear a presentation of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Then let's uh, look to the next thing, and that is to every man that asketh you. Now, this is an important thing, and that is that you've taken this class not simply to get an answer, but to be able to give an answer. And in order to give an answer, we need to be praying for opportunities in which uh, people will ask us for our uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I have made it a practice over the years that when a cultist knocks on my door, I do not close the door in their face. I am not mean to them. I attempt to establish a conversation with them and to share with them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, many times they come, they come in pairs, and this makes it very difficult because once you start dealing with the younger of the two, generally that is the person that is being trained, the older person realizes that you're getting close to uh, the truth, and they begin to move the gospel uh, conversation away or to take it away um, from this person. So it's really important, if we can, to visit people one-on-one. -on -one. one of the things that's really important in having a gospel conversation with somebody immersed in cults is the ability to ask good questions. For example, a cultist will come to your door and say, well, we believe the same that you do. We believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And then we go back and say, we need to ask the question, well, exactly what do you mean by the Son of God? Well, our interpretation is that he is the uh, Michael, Arch Michael the Archangel, who was the first created being. And as a result, he, of course, is a child of God. Now, the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus Christ pre-existed from the foundation of the world and did not begin at Bethlehem. And so it is really important to listen to them and to ask good questions so that we may fully communicate to them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we talk to them about hell and they reject hell, we need to ask them what the scripture means then when it talks about hell. And of course, they will come up with their answers. And again, we need to go back and probe as to why they say what they say. But it's very important to hear and to listen when you talk to a cultist. Now then, let's move to the next one. A reason for the hope that is in you. I want to say to you that the Apostle Paul always used a method that is very powerful. He began by sharing his own testimony. Now, people may argue and disagree with your theology, but they cannot disagree with the transformation of your life. I was once a sinner, but I came to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. My life was full of despair and destruction. Misery was in my way. 
And I found myself constantly in trouble as a young boy. Then one day I met the Lord Jesus Christ and he changed me completely. I was on my way to be a dropout. I was on my way to be a person who was uh, uh, disregarded and disliked and unloved by everyone around because I was a smart aleck know-it-all. And no one could tell me right or wrong and all of that. And yet when I got saved, when I came to the Lord Jesus as my personal savior, a radical transformation took place. They may not believe your gospel, but they cannot argue with a change that is real. Which, by the way, Christian, be very careful that if somebody comes to your house, that you're not standing there with a cigarette in one hand and a beer in the other hand, expecting them, uh, you say Jesus saves and satisfies when you're not uh, satisfied with what Christ has to offer and you turn to something like that. Now, the source of your concern for other people ought to spring out of your vital relationship with Christ. You know, when I got married, I couldn't help but tell everybody about my wife because she was so wonderful and still is. We've been married 30 years now, and I am every day a very thankful man that I have married such a woman. And I want to tell you this. It's not hard to talk about Cindy. It's a wonderful relationship we have. And I am very thankful for her. And it's not hard for me to talk about Jesus. That's because Jesus Christ has made a real transformation in my life. And I have a hope that will last beyond the grave, beyond death, beyond uh, the sufferings of this life. Someday I will be in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So we need to be able to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. Not because I gave up something, not because I did something, not because I was something, but because I put my whole faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who washed away my sins and made me into a new creature. That is a very important thing. Now, let's turn finally with the, to the attitude we need to have as we come to give our answer before these people. The Bible says we should do this with meekness and with fear. Now, we need to be very careful about what the scripture says here. The word meekness carries the idea in the original language of a gentle, loving patience. This doesn't mean that we're weak. It means that we have given ourselves totally over to Christ and are patient when we deal with other people. It dishonors God if we come to somebody in an unloving or a harsh manner. And I've heard many times uh, in my own neighborhood, people yelling at Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons as they go door to door, I have been yelled at myself as I've witnessed for my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, that's not a pleasant experience. But I want to say this to you today. If I deal with these people and I share the gospel with them, it will not be out of anger or upset. I will not try to show them. My goal is to reach them for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word fear here in this passage is a word that is used to refer to our attitude before God. This doesn't mean that we need to set and tremble before God. Rather, or the cultists for that matter, rather it means we need to treat both with respect. Remember that even a Satanist was created in the image of God. And the atheist that opposes Christianity is a person for whom Christ died. We need to remember that even the most ardent opponent of Christianity is simply someone who has been blinded by the God of this world. And remember that the greatest opponent of Christianity was saved by the grace of God through the intervention of God Almighty on the Damascus Road. I'm speaking of the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul told us in his writings 
that the God of the world has blinded the minds of them that believe not the gospel. And so we need to go in with the idea that we're going to open their hearts, open their minds, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to them. In any gospel conversation, we need to look for areas of common ground and establish a personal point of contact. Remember this, that there's always some truth in every religion. Otherwise, no one would be attracted to it. Try to identify the areas of commonality and move uh, from these to each individual soul. And you know what? One of these areas of commonality is individual needs. I always ask people, why did you join this group? Why did you join this this group? And I found almost invariably they either come from cold, ritualistic churches or churches that um, throw hymn books and roll in the aisle and have no Bible teaching. In both cases, uh, these folks have come from a background where there is no belief, is no real doctrinal error anchor rather um, and and as a result of that these people are prey to the false teaching that's come around now it is always important and desirable to witness to these individuals one-on-one -on -one. get an opportunity to share the gospel of christ never lose an opportunity to share the gospel of christ with some lost sinner because you never know you may be used of the Holy Spirit of God to open their heart. For further resources and for greater discussion of this, join us at our course on Thursday at uh, Victory Baptist Church and download all of our materials on uh, www.makingvictory.org. This is Kevin Lucas, Associate Pastor and Director of Bioma of Victory Baptist Church inviting you to our class on cults, world religions, and the occult. May God richly bless you. Check out our website, download the material, study the Bible, and if you are caught in one of these cults, I would dearly love to talk to you about the one who changed my life and made me into a new creature, the Lord Jesus Christ my God and Savior. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Bless thy truth now in Jesus' name.